So yes, I'm Gail Millen-Chalabi. I'm the Geodata Research and Development Officer at the Landmap Service, which is an academic service based at the Mimas National Data Centre, which is a centre of excellence at the University of Manchester. And I'm going to be explaining what spatial data is and how you can access it for your research. So just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to introduce spatial data to you, so the different types of data types there is in spatial data and the data models used and how that's portrayed. And then give you a little bit of a historic context to spatial data, so the data access and analysis. And moving then on to accessing spatial data, so some of really the fundamental pieces of knowledge you need to know when accessing spatial data on the web. So I'm going to cover the OpenGIS spatial consulting standards. And then focusing on the landmark service, which I work for, and some applications of the data that we provide. And then give you a very brief overview of some other spatial data services that may be of use to you. So what is spatial data? Well. Paul Longley um, coined the term that spatial is special. And I think what he means by that is that almost all human activities and decisions usually involve some sort of geographic component. And of course, when we talk about spatial, it doesn't necessarily mean spatial on this earth, but it can refer to any space. So for example, it could be space on a different planet, outer space, and you can look at some very cool um, star constellations on Google Sky, or it could be, say, for example, space of the human body. So when you have an X-ray taken or a CT scan, that is a medical image of what is contained in your body and where that is um, placed in space. Geographic space is specifically defining space on Earth. And for example, um, an OS Explorer map tells you the location of features in space when you go walking, say, um, in the Peak District. And so spatial data can be processed and analysed, and usually it's then displayed on a map, giving you some key information, addressing a specific question that you're trying to answer with that spatial data. And there's lots of different kinds of uh, software packages, GIS packages, such as ArcGIS and Graphs, and image processing packages, which will enable you then to analyze your spatial data. So now looking at the spatial historic context, as you can see, uh, spatial data um, has gone from something which general programmers use to then in the 1970s starting to get GIS developers, pe people specifically working with spatial data and developing spatial programs. Around the mid-1970s is when ESRI formed by Jack Bingemond, which is one of the biggest GIS software companies that provides ArcGIS and his products. And also around the mid-1970s is when you get uh, different satellites as well launching for um, applications such as uh, looking at environmental change uh, crop monitoring and things like that, and Landsat uh, 1 is an example of that. And then later on in the 1980s, you start to get more involved in remote sensing and GIS with a few thousand case setters applying the technology to a small subset of disciplines, so maybe GIS and geology. Moving on to the 1990s, more people, uh, GIS specialists and general users, starting to use spatial data. GPS is becoming much more involved in everyday life. People are starting to use GPS systems in their cars. And by 2000, GPS is becoming commonplace on mobile phones. Mid-2000, we had the launch of Google Earth and uh, Google Maps. And that really then brought spatial data from the non from the specialists to the non-specialists and to a wide range of users from school children all the way to um, a grandmother, for example. So really the 
the use of spatial data has exploded, especially over the past 10 years. And so moving on to the data models, these really underpin uh, spatial data. And there's two different kinds of spa uh, data model. There's the vector data, or sometimes known as feature data. And this basically represents points, lines, and polygons in space. And examples of those would be buildings, roads, tree canopies. And of course, with a vector or feature, you have associated attributes. So for example, um, a tree point may have the attributes of the height of the tree, type of tree it is, how old that tree is. These are all examples of the attributes that are associated to that particular uh, feature point, which we're calling tree. And then of course, there's the raster um, data model. And this sometimes is known as well as coverage data. And this is um, contains cells, or sometimes it's called pixels. And this represents continuous data, or data of simple entities. And examples of raster data include satellite imagery, airborne imagery, digital terrain models, and digital surface models. And what we're trying to do is really represent the real world using these data layers. So each layer represents information about each element of the real world. So in, in respect with this diagram, you have a customer's streets and parcels layer, which is all from the vector data model, and then elevation and land use layers, which fall under the raster data model. And each of these layers will have a spatial reference system associated to them. This means then that each layer um, correctly overlaps on top of each other and it allows you then to compare between data layers. And really a few notes of caution is that you need to consider the spatial resolution of each of your data layers before really comparing between these data layers. And also the use of different data models can affect then your spatial analysis result. So say if you want to compare values between your point data and your DTM data, it might be worth uh, rasterizing your point data so then you are comparing between the same pixel. So moving on to the spatial data analysis tools, well there's quite a wealth of different tools. Um, I come from a geography background so my um, specialisms are really in GIS and image processing packages, but I've also tried to include other types of spatial data products as well, such as computer-aided design and 3D visualisation packages. And as you can see, there's a combination of proprietary and open source packages. So for example, in the GIS, you have ArcGIS and MapInfo, which are proprietary software packages, but there's also other free alternatives, such as Quantum GIS and Graph, which will do similar things. Then you have the image processing packages, which are more focused on um, analyzing the raster data models, so the satellite images and the aerial photography. And examples of these are Erdas Imagine, Envy, Idrisi Kilimanjaro, PCI, and Perfinians. Um, I think that in the University of Manchester, we have licenses for Erdas and Idrisi. But also, if you're interested in the open source software's equivalents, then there's Grass and Open Union as well. For those that are coming from more of a planning uh, architecture background, then you may be more familiar with computer-aided design, or CAD for short. And the proprietary offering of CAD is MicroCAD. And as well, you can do some very interesting 3D models of buildings using the free uh, Google SketchUp. Um, download. And then finally, the 3D visualization packages that really have become very popular from about 2005 onwards include Google Earth, Erdas Titan, and ArcGIS Explorer, and also the Global Mapo, which is also an excellent package for dealing with digital terrain models and LiDAR data. So once um, you've chose the tool that you're going to use to analyze your spatial data, 
then you want to obviously obtain some sort of meaning information from that spatial data. And this is really where the spatial analysis element comes in. And there's a whole wealth of different kinds of analysis um, commands that you can run, such as location analysis, so looking at, um, for example, a buffer zone around, say, a road um, and the environment environmental impact that that has um, around a certain area of that road. You also have things like terrain analysis, so looking at the effect of maybe sloping aspects in relation to vegetation cover, uh, catchment and drainage networks and viewshed analysis in hydrology discipline, for example. You can also do very basic measurements, so measure distance between two different entities and two spatial features, um, for example, measuring the length of a road, a channel. And more, a, a particular discipline, discipline that I find quite interesting is the idea as well of public participatory GIS. And of course, with all these new technologies, that's made that even more possible these days. And really, this involves the general public really engaging in spatial data and giving their perception of um, their view of their neighbourhood, perhaps, using maps or using online mapping. And then there's pattern and class uh, analysis as well, so doing classifications of uh, satellite imagery, for example, and finding classes of the same pixel um, type, and then maybe creating, say, a vegetation map with this classification. So there's lots of different types of spatial analysis, and I have a reference at the end of the presentation where you can look at these um, further. So now moving on to spatial data access. Where do we get this spatial data from and how does this spatial data get to us? I think really with uh, the birth of web services, it's really important to understand the technology behind how spatial data is delivered online. Um, because having this understanding really enables you to um, create your own, say, map uh, mashups and um, appreciation really of what is involved in spatial data delivery from a service perspective. So this screenshot here is of the Open Geospatial Consortium uh, website and this is an organisation that consists of um, the education sector, um, the private sector, government organisations and the aim is, is to develop specifications for the delivery of uh, spatial data um, on the web. And this will ultimately increase spatial interoperability and data sharing. So there's all these standards, and as the plug sockets show here, lots of different standards, but which standard do you use and, and for what thing? So. Um, I just wanted to go through the different standards and how they relate to data access. So to visualize spatial data, there is a specification called a web map service. This provides a portrayal of the spatial data online as a simple PNG or JPEG file. So when you go, say, to a simple geo portal that shows you a map, chances are it's uh, delivering you a web map service behind the scenes. And then usually you would like to style that web map service. And to do this, a standard called the style layer descriptor is used. So if you deliver points on a map online, then you might want to color those points of, as red and change the size of those points, maybe label that point. And this is where the style layer descriptor comes into play. Another recent standard that's emerged is the web map tile service. This is mainly associated with uh, raster data layers, but this allows the web map service to be optimized for delivery on the web by using tiles. And then following on to the visualization of spatial data is the access and delivery of spatial data to the end user. And to do this, there's um, three different uh, specifications. The first one is a web feature service, surprise, surprise, to deliver vector data to the end user. And 
the vector data can be delivered in an extension of the XML called the Geographic Markup Language. That helps you to define the vector feature and the spatial extents of the vector feature using the GML tags. And then the web coverage service allows you to deliver raster data, so deliver the satellite data, the aerial photography data, through that particular specification. And usually you need to know about the data itself, the metadata, or data about data. And to describe the spatial data, an example is to use an ISO standard, such as ISO 19115. And this basically provides all the key information about that data so that you can make sure that the data you download is indeed fit for purpose. And this uh, metadata can be um, managed in a catalog service for the web, and that is the main way of delivering metadata online through a CSW. And this is an example here um, of a spatial data infrastructure because these web services I've just been describing really sit into this middle layer here of the spatial data infrastructure. So this particular diagram has come from ERGAT, the company who specialise in enterprise level uh, spatial data delivery and access. And what you can see here is the geospatial databases. So for example, your vector data you could put in an open source um, database package such as PostGIS, which specialises in managing spatial data. Or you could use an enterprise um, solution such as Oracle Spatial. But really it's not necessary, you could use something that is free and available. And then you have your coverage data, which normally can be sat as flat files on a server. And then the services, the map serv web map services, web heat services and web coverage services provide the data then through to the front-end application for the user. So any geoportals, such as the ones I'm going to show you, and one that I work for at Landmark, Landmark Hire, is an example of a geoportal. But of course, desktop applications as well do support OGC standards. So if you have access to a web map service URL, you can plug that URL into a desktop application such as ArcGIS, and instead of having to download lots of data, you then just get that data seamlessly go into your GIS package. So it can be great time saver to be able to understand these web services that are available online. So now I'm going to focus on the service I work for, Landmark. And Landmark uh, provides web-based access to spatial data and learning materials for UK higher education and further education. Basically, uh, Landmark has uh, different collections. These are the optical and thermal, the radar, the elevation, and feature collections. And well, if you're new to Landmark, what do you need to do? Well, the first thing is that you need to check your institution is licensed. If you're from the University of Manchester, then your institution is licensed for this service. And then you need to register individually. The reason we ask this is that we need to know um, what people will be using the spatial data for and also really for logging purposes for our funding on the Aegis. And then we ask that you familiarise yourself with the landmark uh, licence terms and conditions and also, also the citation guidelines so when you use the spatial data in your thesis or in your research that you do properly cite the data. And then you need your institution username and password to access the protected areas of the Landmark website, such as um, where you download data through Landmark Hire and access any learning content through our learning zone. And so here's some um, examples of the optical and thermal collection that we have currently in the Landmark service. Um, as you can see, um, we have a wide range of temporal scales that are covered. And the data has been obtained over a period of time from different data suppliers. So, for example, the Landsat data and the Topsat data has come from InfraTerra. 
and the historic modern, modern aerial photography and thermal data has come from the Geoinformation Group uh, and the colour infrared from, from Blue Sky. And the idea is, is that we're trying to build up um, regular coverages of spatial data for the UK over time. So our service is very much UK centric. Um, we do have some data for other areas of the world, but mainly our data archive focuses on the UK. And the reason for that is to build up this temporal archive of spatial data. And well, why do we want to do this? Well, for example, to use the data for change detection analysis. So this is just an, a very simple example of the use of aerial photography to look at the land use changes from the old Manchester Ship Canal to what is now south of Keys. So we see here the absence now of the um, ships and the canals now being bridged off and new buildings um, have arisen where the old uh, industrial areas used to be. And then moving on to the radar collection, uh, basically radar is used uh, for monitoring areas without the worry of cloud cover because radar um, uses an active sensor rather than a passive sensor so it doesn't rely on the illumination of uh, sunlight, solar radiation to acquire the image. So images can be acquired both in the night and in the day so if you're looking for regular temporal coverage then radar data is a very good option. And this data has all been acquired from the European Space Agency through a Category 1 project that we have with them. And um, these particular radar in the satellite ASAR and ERS data are C-band data. Uh, and so we also have some new data coming through from ALOS Pulsar, the Japanese satellite, which is L-band data, which penetrates further into the ground, so it could be of use, say, to archaeologists. So um, we do uh, temp about bilinear coverage, uh, biannual, sorry, coverage of um, these data sets for, for the MBSAT data for the UK. And so just an example here of how radar can be used for UK application. This is fire star detection in the Peak District. And what I was looking at here is um, can CBAR SAR intensity and coherence uh, signal detect a fire star within a degraded UK marbled environment? And really looking at the environmental variables that affect SAR intensity, backscatter and coherence signal both inside and outside the fire scar. And just to show you briefly, when a fire occurs, you get a lot of uh, smoke. So again, similar to the cloud, radar could be an ideal candidate for these kinds of applications. And this is a time series here of um, ASAR and DRS2 radar C-band images of the bleak low fire scar. Um, this fire occurred back in and as you can see, the images along the top row are um, before the fire occurred and the two images on the bottom row are after the fire occurred. And there's a relative brightness inside the fire scar which shows that actually the SAR, SAR backscatter increased after the fire had occurred. And when we looked at this um, a little bit more carefully, we found that this was linked then to the increase in precipitation events after the fire occurred. So it was actually, the fire scar was more wet than the surrounding vegetation post-fire. And because it was more wet, the radar backscatter responds to the dielectric content of the water molecules. And this dielectric um, component increases the backscatter of the radar signal and hence it's brighter in the image. So this is just an example of what you could use radar for, for a UK um, case study. And then moving on to the elevation collection, we have lots of different types of elevation data. The lowest resolution, the 75 meter shuttle radar photography mission data or SRTM for short. And this is geocoded to British National Grid so that you don't have to 
do that so it can easily be integrated with OS data. We also have the 25 meter landmark digital terrain model. And then the more recently acquired data that we have is the high resolution five meter blue sky data of England and Wales. And over the last month, we've received some more five meter DTM data and two meter DSM data for Scotland. And we then have the LIDAR data, which is one meter or less in resolution, and that covers the main metropolitan areas of the UK. And I'd like to note here that in terms of LIDAR, we're one of the few services that provide this for free for UK academics. Um, so um, it's definitely worth uh, having a look at, at that data set. And just to give you an example of how some of our elevation data is being used, this is a 3D modelling of the Jurassic Coast. And if you think that spatial data is just for the geographers, it's not. Um, this is an example here from Ravensbourne College of Design and Communication down at London. Uh, they're located right near the O2 Arena. And they're really um, a very mixed bunch of researchers and these images have been provided here by Professor Jeremy Gardner who produced our data and what he was doing was using a computer numerically controlled milling machine um, and this allows then a 3D model to be created. He converted our data to .stl files and um, then used those um, in this is a CAD software package that he created these images with. But then those values were put into this milling mach machine and using subtractive graphic prototyping, this means he has a block of material and chips away at it using the data values. He was actually able to create his own tangible 3D model. And what he plans to do is this is just a prototype that I'm showing but is to create um, a big 3D model that is going to go and be put in, I think it was an art gallery, because his background is actually art. <laughs> so it's a very different kind of application for our data. And then finally, the feature collection, we have building heights and building class of the main conurbations of the UK. These are in shapefile format, so they can easily be put into GIS or image processing packages. And this is just an example of those mashups that I was talking about where you can use a combination of data to create your own visualizations in um, easily accessible tools such as Google Earth. And I just thought I would briefly mention about our learning zone. If this kind of um, data, spatial data is new to you, then we do have a learning zone which contains a range of different courses. We have courses on airborne imaging, flying kites, UK map, which is one of our latest data sets. This covers the whole of the London area and has seven very detailed spatial data layers, including a five meter digital terrain model, aerial photography, and uh, building classes, an overlay layer of tree canopies. And um, so there's a lot of detailed information in that new UK map data that we have online. And also we do the image processing courses for those main software packages that I was telling you about earlier. And we have um, a course on introduction to radar because we're really trying to increase the usage of that radar collection. And classica classification methods and scripting, which have been specifically requested from postgraduate students across the UK who really wanted to see those kinds of courses available. And as you can see, these courses cover um, from the basic level through to the advanced level. And we are planning on adding further courses into the learning zone. We have uh, image processing for graphs that we'll be adding over the um, next couple of months. And also, we're going to be incorporating um, a repository into the learning zone as well called ELOGEO, which um, allows academics and students across the UK to deposit e-learning content into the repository 
about spatial open data, um, open source, uh, spatial data tools, and uh, open standards. So the standards I was telling you about, the Grant Melby uh, presentations and um, courses and case studies added to this ELOGO repository. So there's lots of good stuff happening in terms of the e-learning front for, for spatial data. So just briefly, the other spatial services that are available to UK academics. You may have heard of Digimap. This is based at the Adena National Data Centre at the University of Edinburgh. And they provide a whole range of different kinds of um, mapping map data. Uh, historic Digimap, Geology Digimap, Marine Digimap, and now with survey um, collection as well. And it will just depend on whether your institution has um, subscribed to all of these collections or not, whether you have access to these. So on Light Landmap, where it's freely available, the institution doesn't have to subscribe. Um, with Digimap, there are some subscription fees associated to the collections. And here's just an example of the ONU survey data that Digimap provide. So it's a five-step download process, and um, you can uh, download both vector and hand master data uh, from their portal. The next um, type of data service I wanted to tell you about were the NERC spatial data services. And there's several. There's NEODAS, which I'm showing you here. This has, again, um, radar data, but they also produce other um, value-added products, such as vegetation indices, sea surface temperature maps, and ocean colour uh, data. And there is also another collection, the Neovert um, service, and they provide uh, Landsat and spot data, and they do have a small amount of um, e-learning content as well on their website to help you using that data. And they also provide access to data that is generated through the other service, ARSF, the Airborne Research Survey Facility, which is uh, based at Oxford. So the ARSF, basically they have a plane where they can fly across um, study areas, both in the UK and abroad. And you can submit um, a um, application to them detailing the study area that you would like to have flown, and then they will review that and let you know if that application has been successful or not. But the data that they then generate for these projects, these selected projects, they stay with the researcher for about two years, and then after the two year period, they then get delivered through the Neobit service. Another great spatial data service, again, that's, um, there's a lot of data free at the point of access, is the Global Land Cover Facility. This is based at the University of Maryland. And as you can see, they've got a great range of satellite data here from Aster, Iconos, Clipbird, Landsat, Modis, and SRTM. One thing I'd highlight here is the SRTM that you will get from GLCF will be in geoglobal coordinates. So if you want SRTM for the British Isles, then Landmap has already um, projected that data to British National Grid for you, so it saves you that extra step. Um, but again, uh, some great data and costs. This covers um, lots of different areas of the globe. So if you're looking outside the UK, then this could be a really good service uh, for you to go and have a look at. And there's been a real big movement in terms of opening up data. Just before Gordon Brown left power, he agreed to open up some of the audit survey data, and now they have an OS open data website, which details um, allows you to download all these different OS products. And also, um, I didn't mention with the uh, Digimap Adena, they provide a service called OS OpenStream. And with OpenStream, you can register and they provide you with a key. 
and then you can add that URL into a desktop software and basically have your OS data um, served through a web map service directly into your desktop software. You don't even have to download the data and then you can just use that as your base map in your research. So there's lots of very in useful tools with all of those different data services. And just finally to wrap up some further reading for the spatial analysis methods, I would say if you're really interested in remotely sensed data and image interpretation, then the Lily Sam book is a really great one. Um, it gives you a good overview of the different aspects of satellite data. The um, Paul Langley, Michael Goodchild, and the Rife book is really good for um, trying to understand further about geographical information systems the types of spatial analysis you can do in GIS um, and how GIS science has developed. And the Haywood book is a real sort of basic introduction to spatial data. It explains further about those spatial data models, uh, which we do spoke about in the previous talk. In terms of online resources, the spatialanalysisonline.com website um, actually provides you with a link to a downloadable PDF um, of a great geospatial analysis book. And this is the URL for the Open Geospatial Consortium website if you would like to actually find out more about those standards and specifications, the web map services and web coverage services and actually look at those specifications in more detail.